Chapter One of Lord Dolphin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Lord Dolphin by Harriet Anna Cheever. Chapter One Lord Dolphin Introduces Himself now who ever heard of a fish's sitting up and telling his own story oh you needn't laugh you young folks perhaps you will find that i can make out very well considering of course i have been among folks else i could never use your language or know anything about you and your ways a message is not received direct from the depths of the sea very often and especially from one of the natural natives and then there are very few fishes that ever have an experience like mine and travel from one continent to another going both by sea and by land you surely will open your eyes pretty widely at that and wonder how a fish could go anywhere by land have patience and you shall hear all about it by and by i was born deep down in the mediterranean sea that long name is no stranger you have seen it many a time in your geographies but could you tell the meaning of it i wonder i can it means midland sea and is so named from being so near the middle of the earth if the mediterranean sea should be pulled up and away together with the space it occupies my what a hole there would be in the big round earth nowadays even the little folks hear a great deal about europe some of the family have very likely been there perhaps even small john or elizabeth have themselves crossed the great ocean sailing on a fine steamer to the coast of england or ireland oh ho if you had fins and could spread them like sails and cut through the water like a flash you would have a very different idea of the word distance from what you have now i know folks do not think it very nice to talk much about one's self but if there is no one else to introduce you and it is necessary that those with whom you are talking should know the truth about you it can be plainly seen that the only thing to do is to tell the personal story as modestly and as truthfully as possible when i first saw the light deep down in the sea i was quite a little fellow and had a mother that took splendid care of me she never had but one child at a time and that one she watched over and tended with much affection until it was fully able to take care of itself my name is dolphin and the dolphin family is a large one one branch is of a very peculiar shape and has a long and pointed nose or beak from which it is called the sea goose or the goose of the sea i belong to that branch but as to being a goose allow me to say i never was one and never shall be not really and truly my head is round and so large that it forms almost a third of my whole body many folks traveling by water have seen dolphins as once in a while we are obliged to toss our heads up out of the water in order to breathe as we have lungs yet it is not necessary for us to breathe as folks do and we can blow out water in an upward stream from little holes that are over our eyes my colors are fine dark almost black on my back gray at the sides white and shiny as satin underneath there are strange things about a dolphin one is that when one is about to die the colors are very beautiful in growing faint tinted where once dark new and brilliant shades flash forth that change and glow in showy tints in our beak are thirty or forty sharp teeth on each side of the jaw our voices are peculiar we are said to make a kind of moan which you know is not a very cheerful sound this is strange as we are really very lively creatures and bright and happy in disposition not at all moany or sad then we have a kind of small tank or reservoir inside the chest and near the spine which is filled with pure blood this you must know is separate from the veins and if we stay very long under water we can draw from this reserve supply causing it to circulate through the body there is a great deal of wisdom in all this 
that a poor fish cannot understand but folks must know how these strange things come about and who makes and guides all creatures everywhere but a dolphin cannot take it in at all we are a merry friendly tribe there probably are no fish that swim the sea that are fonder of folks than we dolphins and we cannot help feeling quite proud because of what folks have appeared to think of us and i must explain why i do so grand a thing as to call myself lord dolphin to begin with in long years past in ancient times as they are called folks had an idea that we were able to do them good in some ways and so were of special value to them and certain old coins or pieces of money had the figure of a dolphin stamped on them it also was on medals which you know are of gold silver and copper and are given to folks as a reward for having done a good job or a brave deed the figure of a dolphin was also sometimes embroidered on ribbon to be used as a badge showing that the wearer belonged to a particular society or order using the dolphin as an emblem or it might be again that the figure showed one to be a member of an ancient or noble family then there are strange and attractive stories of myths imaginary forms or persons like fairies gods and goddesses when you are older you will study about these ancient make-believe beings and the study will be called mythology telling curious interesting stories about the myths apollo one of the so-called deities was a myth and said to be the god of music medicine and fine arts a great friend of mankind and a great favorite i was said to be of apollo's orion another myth and a most exquisite player of the lute so charmed the dolphins with his playing that once being in great trouble and throwing himself into the sea a dolphin bore him on his back to the shore some folks have called us whales but we are not whales at all and are of an entirely different family yet i am a big fellow all of eight feet long while some of us are still much longer than that but the chief cause of pride with the dolphins is the notice that has been taken of us and the honor shown us by the royal family of france why we formed at one time the chief figure on the coat of arms of the princes of france a coat of arms perhaps you know is a family crest or medal having on it a figure or device which a high-born family adopts as its particular sign or emblem of nobility then the french people once named a province of france for us calling it dorfane and pronounced dor fa -ne. but greatest of all the honors shown us is the fact that the little men babies born of the french kings and heirs to the throne of france were called the dauphin taken from our name are we not distinguished and do you wonder that we have a somewhat exalted idea of ourselves after such honors as these have been heaped upon us and do you think in view of these facts that i am taking on too grand a title in announcing myself as lord dolphin dear me i do hope not it would be such a pity to make a mistake right at the outset in telling a story for truth to tell i am not a bit proud but just a good-natured chap that has decided to spin a sea yarn for the amusement and i hope the instruction it may be of young folks being perfectly willing the older folks should hear it too if they like and i don't believe the smaller folks will object to the title even if they don't have lords in this country it must be that they are all lords here all the nice men folks do you wonder what i live on fishes of course for we do not have a very great chance at getting other kinds of food under water i like herrings best of all and feed on them oftener than on any other kind of fish there is just one fellow that i cannot endure that is the flying fish i fight make war on him and drive him away every time he comes around oh but he is the trying creature forever flying in your face getting in your way prying into your affairs a kind of gossip fish that i despise why i feel so great a dislike for him i cannot say it must be there is something in my nature that sets me against him 
but a flying fish and a dolphin cannot live along the same wave there is another page in my history that must be mentioned several hundred years ago our flesh used to be eaten and what is more it was thought to be fine so that only those who had a great deal of money could afford to have it on their tables but nowadays we are never used for food but are thought to be coarse and not nearly as nice as most other kinds of fish all right we are very glad not to be in danger of being devoured we go sailing along under the bright surface of the sea in groups of just ourselves and such leaps as we can take by and by you will hear of leaps i have taken which have been the means of my learning a great deal away we scud passing ships that think they are going pretty fast but oh neptune our fins and tails take us along at a spanking rate which makes the ships seem slow in one thing we are much like folks don't laugh please but we are very very fond of music sometimes we catch the sound of voices singing on a vessel and up we go leaping fairly into the air to get as near the sound as possible and should there be a violin a guitar a flute or a cornet oh yes i know them all on a passing vessel we float alongside just far enough under water to keep our bodies out of sight while we take in the strains in our own peculiar way for although our ears might be hard to find we yet absorb or draw in sound very readily and now that you know quite a little about the dolphin family i will tell you some things that may interest you about my watery home for home you know is wherever one lives whether it be in the air on the earth in the earth or in the waters under the earth End of chapter 1. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Chapter 2 of Lord Dolphin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Lord Dolphin by Harriet Anna Cheever. Chapter 2 under the waves pretty soon i must describe my playground but first you must learn a few simple things about the place i love best of all places in the world my home in the deep deep sea do you suppose that when the sky is dark and threatening up where you live and when the wind is blowing like a hurricane and the great waves lash about acting as if mad that there is great disturbance far below do you suppose that when shipmasters are shouting out orders to the crew and trying to keep their vessels from turning topsy-turvy or going down out of sight, that the fishies are scampering about wild, driven here and there by the fierce winds, and scared half to death by the fury of the storm? Do you suppose there is a terrible roar of wind and wave that bangs us against each other at such times, and makes of the undersea a raging bedlam? Oh, by no means! There is nothing of the kind down in what folks call the lower ocean, it is calm and quiet as the surface of a pond on a pleasant summer day. And yet, if you wonder how I first learned about the lashing and the thrashing of the waves above our heads when there is a storm, let me tell about the time when I was a naughty, willful fish, bound to have my own way and do just as I pleased. It was when I was quite young, yet pretty well grown. And this makes me wonder if growing little men folks and women folks ever are determined to have their own way, no matter what the mother may say. I have an idea it is what is called the smart age, when the young, whether fish, flesh or fowl, start up all at once and think they know more than all the ancients. I heard that expression used once, and it seemed somehow to fit in here. Well, I was a young big fellow, when one day I felt the will strong within me to take leaps toward the upper sea, now, I have already said that my mother took the best and most watchful care of me when I was a chicken fish, so when she saw how restless and venturesome I appeared that day, she tried her best, poor dear, to turn me from my purpose. For she was older and wise, and could tell by certain signs when the upper currents were seething and boiling. So when I darted upwards with a strong swirl that cut the waters apart from my passage, she thrust herself farther ahead, trying to drive me back 
and said plainly by her actions, Don't go aloft, my son, you will rush into danger. Heed the warnings of your mother, and stay where the waters are untroubled and safe. No, I was getting to be a smart man-fish, and must be allowed to go where I would. Very well, I went. Upward and upward I dove, until, oh distress, I was caught by the turmoil and confusion of a great storm. I had gone too far, because of knowing far less than I thought I did. Do you ask why I did not immediately dive downwards again? Alas, I couldn't. I had raised myself into the storm circle, and, big creature that I was, I had need to learn that there were mighty forces of the sea that made all my strength as a mere wisp of straw when placed against them. Do not folks, I wonder, sometimes find it much easier to get into a hard place than to get out of it? That was what I found then, being driven about first this way, then that. I was slammed against a great roaring billow that sent me off presently in another direction, merely to be met by another wave that dashed me against a third one. My instincts that served me for mind and brains taught me that if I wanted to get down to quiet, restful depths, I must dive head foremost directly toward the bottom of the sea. Oh, what folly to try! No sooner would I get my great head and long nose pointed for a swift downward plunge than a thundering billow would actually toss me into the air, just as I have seen a spurt of spray toss a cockle shell. Oh, but I saw strange sights and heard strange sounds that night. Once, when two waves came together, I was not only tossed high in air, but for several moments I actually rode atop of the rolling foam. It was then that I had my first view of folks. What wonderful beings! My first thought was, could it be some new, amazing kind of fish that could stand upright? You see, I had up to that time only known creatures that lay flat, that flapped fins in order to get along, or in order to try what is called by the long word locomotion. But here were fine, tall objects that were in every way so different. I indeed knew at once that they were far above and superior to the little creatures that flew, to anything that crawled, and to any kind of fish that swam the seas. A great vessel was straining and tugging, and I could see lights here and there that showed the water black as night. Sailors' voices rose high above the surging of water and the tempest's loud cry. There were queer little holes in the sides of the vessel that I know now are called portholes, and big guns were pointed out through them. A sailor with a rope about his waist tried to walk across the deck, but was thrown along the wet and slippery boards like a ball tossed from the hands of a child. In a queer set of outside garments that I have learned are called oilskins, the crew, officers and captain went to and fro, trying their best to keep things straight. In some way I knew that the brave captain was not afraid. A little pale he was, surely, but his voice was firm as he called through a strange fixture called the ship's trumpet, and his hands did not shake as he tried to peer through a great glass across the rolling sea. The sailor with the rope about him was again and again tossed and tumbled about as he tried to make the passage across the deck, but as often as he tried, his mates would have to pull on the rope and right him, and I still think, as I did that night, that a ship's crew, sailors, officers and captain are brave, brave folk, the bravest folks I know. As the storm went crashing on, I kept thrusting myself downward, in hopes to plunge lower than the storm circle. No use. I was upborne every time, and after many attempts knew it would be best to simply float as I must. I had drifted far from the sailing vessel when, as I floated high on the crest of a wave, I looked upon a pleasure craft of some kind, riding high upon the breakers. Men who were not regular sailors looked with startled eyes on the terrible sea. They were calm and quiet, but from the way they questioned the staunch skipper, and watched the men forming the crew. I knew they carried anxious hearts, and longed to see the waters grow calmer. A hard fling sent me afloat again, and I had a peep inside the cabin, where ladies with white faces and clasped hands were whispering of the storm, and listening with fear in their eyes to the wild clamour of the winds. Then there was a peep beyond, that showed me something that to this day I cannot understand, but I tell it because my instincts assure me 
that boy folks and girl folks in good homes with good parents will know just what it meant. And although I am only Lord Dolphin, a great fish of the sea, there was something about it that has comforted me, and I think always will comfort me as long as I live. I saw a little girl, oh, a fair little creature, with fluffy golden hair shading her babyish face, who was on her knees beside a white and gilded berth. A berth, you know, is a small bed, built right against the wall in any kind of a vessel, be it sailor, steamship, or yacht. I think this was some rich man's yacht. The fair little lady, then, was on her knees beside her gilded berth, her elbows resting on the pretty white bed, eyes closed, tiny white hands clasped, and lips moving. She surely was talking to someone, but who, I cannot even guess. But this much was certain, that child was not afraid, not in the least. She must have wakened from sleep, else she would not have been alone. And hearing the wild storm, she had slipped from her little bed, put herself on her knees, and raised her dear fearless little hands and heart. Where? Oh, surely that child had a friend somewhere whom she trusted. How beautiful! They say that fishes and some other creatures are cold of blood, and have but little feeling. But I have gone far enough to think out one thing, and it all comes of that child on her knees. If a dear mite of a woman like that had a great powerful friend she could talk to in the dark, and feel safe with in such a tempest, just as true as I am a living dolphin, I believe it must be someone strong enough and good enough to care for all kinds of creatures. I do indeed. Do you wonder it comforts me? It was strange that after a while the moon came struggling through the black and angry sky. She rode high, did Luna, that is the moon's name, and was at the full, and wherever the clouds parted for a moment, a broad streak of luminous light shone down on great mountains of water, leaping up and up, as if eager to crush everything before them. The wind did not soon go down, it could not. Neither could I, with my utmost strength, dive downwards through the piled-up violent waves that still rushed and roared, bounded and snapped with wild force. Luna had sailed toward the west, and a gleam of daylight was streaking the sky at the east, before the churning, choppy waters began leaping less high, and once again I was tossed crest-high, where I was glad to catch sight of a sailing vessel that was steadying herself in the distance, and a white yacht was skipping like a frightened but rescued bird afar off. I do not know whether I had been terribly afraid or not. I was not afraid of the sea itself. It was what folks call my native element. The place in which I was born was natural to me, and I was native to it. But yes, I think I was afraid that the coming together of those fierce waves might crush me as they met in their terrible strength. The noise of such a meeting could be heard miles away. Ships have been in great peril from them, and fish have often had the life beaten out of them in such a sea. Yet, naughty fellow that I was, no great harm came to me. As soon as I saw my chance, head down I plunged, out of the harsh circle of the storm. Oh, the peacefulness and the restfulness of those quiet lower regions! For far below, all strife of angry billow and raging storm was unknown, and glad enough was I to reach my mother's side. It may have been that my own plump sides were puffed out with the effort I had made, and the storm's rough tossing, and my absence and the direction I had taken all told my mother that something had gone hard with me, and that I was glad to again be near her in the silent depths of home. She floated with me close alongside, guided me to a restful grove midst shimmering weeds that made a soft and silken couch, where in the sweet stillness, lulled by the lap of gentle ripples against weed, or shell, or bending sea-flowers, I glided off to dreamless slumber. And the last thing I saw before slipping off to quiet sleep was a little bright-haired child on her knees, eyes closed, hands upraised and folded, a child that was not afraid. End of chapter 2「Three of Lord Dolphin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Lord Dolphin by Harriet Anna Cheever. Chapter 3. A Coral Grove. 
Perhaps you did not know that the fishes in the sea, both large and small, were playful creatures. Well, they are. They can frisk, frolic, play hide-and-seek, catch, and race and romp at a great rate. Now, I want to tell you something of our playground, and if you are surprised at the beauty with which we are surrounded, why should you be? There surely are lovely things on the earth for all kinds of upper-air creatures, such as folks, animals, birds, and insects, to enjoy. Listen, then, while I tell you about the caverns of ocean. A cavern, you know, is a hollow or den, and old ocean holds many a cavern or den, full of interest and beauty. But I will take you first to a kind of grove. My home, where I spend most of my time, is in deep water. But not in the deepest, oh no. That is said to be two thousand fathoms down. Think of it, more than two miles below the surface. There probably is but very little life at that depth. But when I visit some groves, or the region of a reef, I must first sail and sail until I reach water that is not deep at all. Do you think you have ever seen coral, real coral? Yes, doubtless you have, and you may have seen it in various forms. But I feel sure you have never seen coral to know very much about it, as you have never been to the bottom of the sea. Ah, here are all kinds of graceful shapes, shooting up from the depths, so singular and varied in form that one would wonder what they are meant to stand for. Look at these trees, perfect little trees in coral, eight or ten feet high, with branches spreading out from the trunk. On the branches are delicate sprays of the fairy-like net, or lace-work, all in white, but of various patterns. Should you get near enough, you would see that these branches, some of which seem to bear flowers in shapes like pinks or lilies, are dented or pitted as if tiny teeth had eaten into them. This may be partly the work of worms. Now this is simply a large piece of white coral, but all around and about are fanciful shapes nearly as large as the one described. Here too are what might be taken for thick bushes or shrubs, branching out with sprays of fretwork, white and spotless. Then there are smaller growths, like low plants, and curiously coloured, some pink, some red, others a yellowish-white. These, too, appear to bear flowers, asters, carnations or roses. And for miles at a time, you can rove and sport in a beautiful coral grove. Think of a little house, if you can, made entirely of ivory with here and there bright tints mingling with the white. For coral looks like ivory when its natural roughness is smoothed and polished. Think of swimming through little rooms, under arches, over lovely walks, through make-believe doors, slipping past upright altars of red and white coral, resting on spreading seats, or under outreaching canopies, or stopping to look at another outreaching shape, like the arms of candelabra or candlestick holders, sliding over footstools and under culverts, all soft and gleaming in colour. Then again there are curves and passages in which we can hide and stay hidden as long as we please. Is it not beautiful? And all so clean and clear. Yet there is need to take heed and be careful. These stretching shapes and branches these candle-holders and bushy twigs have sharp, hard points, and bouncing against them too suddenly might severely wound a fish, or it might slip into a crevice where it would be pricking work to get out. Now what is coral? Is it alive? Does it live and breathe? It is one of the curious, mysterious things of the ocean about which folks have written and studied. And the wise ones say that coral is neither insect nor fish, but a kind of sea animal that lives in both deep and shallow waters. In the beginning, it appears to be a tiny sea creature, like a small fleshy bag, with a mouth at one end, while with the other it clings to some object, almost always a rock. These little creatures are said to have the power to sting if they are provoked. From these tiny frames there comes a hard, stony substance that spreads and spreads, as we have seen, while the part that was alive becomes a mere dead shell. 
This is the best explanation I can give about coral and the tiny creatures from which it takes its start, and that seem so exceedingly small to me to be called sea animals. But think of the wonderful formations that grow from the bodies of these mites of creatures. Why, there are whole reefs or chains of rocky borders along some coasts made entirely of coral. Some of them are known as barrier reefs. Bless you, it may be hard to believe, but a barrier reef 1,200 miles long runs along the coast of Australia, between the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Then there are coral islands in the Pacific Ocean, whole platforms of solid coral, which shut in portions of quiet water in some places. The little corals themselves do not work in deep water, nor above the surface of the sea, but the bony substance spreads and spreads up, down and across the sea, and as many shellfish eat into coral, great quantities of fine coral sand sink to the bottom, making a nice white carpet for the fishes to glide over. Folks do not take coral from the sea at any time, but during the months you call April, May and June. Now remember these things when you go into houses and see fine large pieces of coral on the mantel, or it may be standing against the wall. Perhaps you have a coral necklace of little uneven red stick-like beads. The jeweller man can tell you how very hard it is to drill the holes in these beads. It is like drilling through hard rock. But if you happen to have a necklace, brooch or bracelet of pink coral, my, you had better take good care of it, for it must have cost a little bag of gold. Pink coral is rare, beautiful and very expensive. The genuine pink tinted is said to have sold for so great a price as five hundred dollars for a single ounce. Hey ho, I want neither necklace, brooch nor bracelet, for where, pray, would Lord Dolphin wear a breastpin, or how would he look with a string of coral beads about his neck, or a bracelet pinched about his tail? You needn't laugh so hard. I have seen folks who hung too much jewellery about themselves, and seem to think it becoming. A few pieces of nice jewellery may be tasteful and ornamental, but when too much is worn, I have a fancy that it might make a coral mite or an oyster want to laugh. Pretty soon I must explain why an oyster might have a right to be amused at seeing too many gems crowded on at once. But first you must hear something funny about coral, something so silly too that even a fish is almost ashamed to tell of it. But this was true long in the past, Folks are much wiser now. Long years ago, there were folks who believed that wearing a charm, which often was a little piece of coral, perhaps made into an ornament, would charm away harm or danger and keep them safe from the evil eye. Dear sakes, you cry, what was the evil eye? Well, it is almost sad to think that anyone could be so foolish. Yet when folks know but little, they will catch up strange notions and listen to silly signs without an atom of truth or common sense in them. So some ignorant folks once believed that a witch, or some witchy folk with an evil eye, might look upon them and cause them harm, or make them meet some danger. And they pretended that hanging a bit of coral somewhere about them would keep off a look from the evil eye, and that making children wear a piece of it would charm away sickness and act as a medicine. Now did you ever! Chinese folks and Hindus have made most exquisite and wonderful carvings of the coral of the Mediterranean, and there is such a thing as black coral, also known as brain coral, but it is too brittle to be worked upon. Ah, who would not be a dolphin, merry and free, whisking through deep still water, coasting over coral sands, and diving and sporting through coral groves? Nor is this the only rare and curious place through which I rove, chasing my comrades, wandering about in search of caverns below, and sweet music above, while forever making war on my enemy, the flying fish. You see, these fish can cut through the water, reach the surface, then really fly with finny wings across short spaces right in the air. They think themselves smart, and are great braggarts. One morning a flying fish was bent on worrying me, swishing its flapping fins directly before my face, then darting upward, sending the spray crosswise into my eyes. I made a snap or two at the vexing creature, but as I missed him, he became bolder, 
and stopped a race I was having with one of my mates. Suddenly I made a great leap after the flyer, but up he went, up, up, and I after him, sharp. Further up he went, and I pursued. He laughed, fish fashion, his big mouth sprawling way across his face as he sped above the surface. I poked my nose into upper air and saw which way he was going, and to my joy he made a dip just as up went my beak again, and I had him squeezed securely between my jaws. Of all the wriggling and squirming, the begging and the pleading that ever you saw or heard, but I did not want to eat him, nor did I mean to kill him either, but I did mean to teach old Mr. Flyer a lesson, showing it was neither wise nor in good taste to torment a fish fellow that was ever so much larger and stronger than himself. So down, down I went, until I reached a cell in a coral grove, and in I popped his majesty, and sat down and grinned at him. My turn to show a wide mouth now. Did you know a fish could tremble? That fellow trembled and shook, as if he had a fishy fit when he found himself in that den, with a great dolphin's eye on him. Perhaps it was indeed an evil eye to him. He could have slipped out and away, would I only move and give him room. Oh, no, not just yet. I lashed the water with my strong tail, and made up eyes at him, I am afraid, in a truly evil way. Then I began to feel that it was neither kind nor noble to carry my punishment too far. So off I slowly sailed, and out from his tight corner slid my slippery prisoner, and he tormented me no more. I did not mean to harm him, and do not think I did, but he slipped sideways through the water ever after that. It must be that he jammed a fin in his haste to escape from his cubby, but I see him often, and always with that sideways gait. I hope he is cured forever of making of himself a pester and a plague. I was glad to see that he still could fly, and that swift as an arrow he could dart over and under, through and across, the thousand winding ways of our coral groves. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Lord Dolphin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Lord Dolphin by Harriet Anna Cheever. Chapter Four: The Mermaid's Cave. As I have never been in a truly house, I cannot know of all the kinds of carpets or coverings that folks use on the floors. Yet I have had peeps at very lovely carpets, as in a ship's cabin, and I know that velvet and fine beautiful straw as well as other kinds of nice carpets must be used in what folks call their houses oh but never has a floor of wood been covered with such wonderful material or covering of such marvellous workmanship as that over which i have roamed and on which i have rested all my life yet except in deep waters i will not pretend that my carpets are always very soft in the deeper waters that i love there are miles and miles of soft blue mud that to a dolphin is far more luxurious and enjoyable than the thickest of velvet or the most closely evenly plaited straw could be. But when, after a long, delightful journey, I visit the regions of shallower waters, ah, the most beautiful things I could bring you were there a tunnel, a car, or an air shaft to convey me safely to land. What are these shining, many-coloured things I see lying about with all kinds of fishes sailing around and playing with, as a child plays with blocks or cards? Shells! All kinds and shapes, many of them rough outside, but smooth and glossy as glass inside. What is a shell? You know the word marine, called marine, means belonging to the sea. So shells are marine curiosities for they are always found in or near the sea, and they are really the hard outer covering of some sea animal or other. But how can I describe shells such as I have looked upon a thousand times? You have seen some kinds, I know, and they would not even pass as samples of these splendid shapes and tints that lie scattered around my floor. A few folks have made a study of the different kinds of shells that have floated or been carried to the shore, and have been able to tell the class of sea animals to which they have belonged. They once were the coat or outside garment of a swimmer or a clinger of the sea. One day a mother dolphin missed her boy dolphin, and as he was quite a young fellow, she felt much distressed. 
Away she sailed, peering amidst the many objects covering the sea floor. Do you suppose it is an easy matter to find a fish that has got lost? I caught the flying fish because he never got far away from me. But there was a young rascal that had gone off roaming almost before he knew how to feed himself, and search as she might, nowhere could his mother find the rogue of a runaway. If you will believe it, he was gone a week, and then back he came, his eyes as big as saucers. You see, I know how to say some things that folks do. By and by you will find out how I learned them. Master Dolphy had a story to tell. He made us understand in fish language that he had found a wonderful, wonderful cave where a party of mermaids had collected a lot of shells. Oh, uh, enough to fill a great house. Now, I can't tell a thing as to the truth about mermaids, but they say, that is, folks and fishes say, that they are strange, fascinating creatures with the head, shoulders, arms, and breast of a beautiful woman and part of the body and the tail of a fish. Sometimes they are called sea nymphs. Others call them sirens. Have you ever lived by the sea? And on stormy evenings, when rain was rattling on the window pane and the wind went screaming round the house, have you ever imagined that there were queer calls, and have you seen strange shapes thrown up by the waves? Or have you ever heard an old sailor or an old fisherman tell stories of the deep? If not, you cannot take in the kind of spell or enchantment that lingers about the sea after listening to those sounds or hearing those stories. They are all mixed up with the myth stories you hear of a little way back. But these stories have been told ever since the world was young, and the mermaids are said to be daughters of the river god that have lived ever in the deep and sounding ocean. And they were strange and weird, that is, wild, unnatural, and witching. They would appear in both calm and stormy weather. Sirens were sometimes thought to be different from mermaids, but we fishes know them to be one and the same thing, that is, if they exist at all. It used to be said that a mermaid murmured, but that a siren sang with dangerous sweetness. Both murmur and both sing, one as much as the other. They will all at once be seen poised on perilous rocks, their long and splendid hair floating back in the wild wind, their eyes shining like stars, their faces bright and glorious, their white arms and gleaming shoulders rising like snow from midst the dark and stormy waves. Ah, the singing, the beckoning, and the coaxing of a mermaid. Let me tell you how they work. They have a sly, four-legged creature on land, all dressed in fur, and sporting a fine, thick tail, and they say that when this Madame Puss wants to catch a bird that is wheeling in the air, she will manage to first catch its eye. Then the little creature will not be able to look away, but will wheel and circle and circle and wheel, all the time coming nearer, until if no one frightens Madame Puss away, she will keep her yellow eye fixed on the eye that she has caught, until the bird flies close to her and is caught. This is called charming a bird, and the truth must be that poor birdie, after catching sight of that great shining eye, does not see Madame Puss herself, but only the bright eye, and being unable to look away, flies nearer and nearer the strange glittering light until Madame Puss makes a spring, and all is over. White faces seemed to rise and ride atop of the foaming billows. Just so, it is said, the sailors cannot look away from the fair, wonderful creatures tossing their rich hair, beckoning wildly, singing and singing with a sweetness that is not natural or earthly, until, what with the beauty and luring and voices of honey, the poor sailormen are close against the rocks, and do not seem to know that they are charmed or harmed when the waters close softly over them. I do not know whether I have ever seen a mermaid or not, but when I took that dangerous voyage up into the storm circle, I saw strange shapes that I never saw before, and heard sounds that were new to my ear. Two or three times I thought I saw streaming hair, and white faces seemed to rise and ride atop of the foaming billows. But when one is very much excited, will not imagination produce almost any kind of an object that happens to come into the mind? Uh, I am afraid so. Still, there are folks and fishes that believe in the mermaids and their songs, 
and what am I that I should dare dispute them? Yet, let me whisper, I have heard that folks who do not know so very much will tell about goblins, spooks, and catchums, and whenever there is talk about the mermaids and the sirens, I think of those folks who believe in creatures that never were. But it would not do to talk in my watery home as if I had no belief in mermaids, because, you see, as most fishes have never been with folks and learned a thing or two from them, they do not know any better than to believe in these sweet, dangerous creatures. So, now, here came Dolphy, with flapping fins, wild eye, and his story of a mermaid's cave. Then a party was made up to go and see the rare and amazing place. Well, it did look as if some creatures of surprising taste and skill had brought together a collection of shells such as are never seen above the surface of the sea, and formed indeed a cave fit for a mermaid's home. I know little about time, but it must have been days and nights I stayed in the enchanting place, roving hither and thither, rubbing my fins against the soft, smooth shells, and half wondering how they really came to be grouped together in such shining rows. And the colours, and the shapes. Some were well opened on the inside and looked as if entirely covered with pink enamel. They were of clear ivory white, pinkish white, pale rose, deep rose, a pale yellow, or straw colour, orange yellow, blue and green mixed in glossy sheen, shades of pink running into rich reds, purples, and greyish pinks, making the fair sweet mother of pearl. Some were cup-shaped, having deep hollows. Should you hold your ear fairly shot into one of these, it is said you would hear always, as often as you so held it, the roaring of the ocean. And a roaring sound you would hear in very truth. Yet let me tell you, take a common china cup, shut your ear into it, and the same roaring will be heard. Is that old ocean? No, it is simply the sound of your own blood coursing through your veins. A wide-awake Frenchman once wrote that, could you look within your own body and see the engines pumping, the valves opening and shutting, the pipes working, and the whole machinery in action, it would surprise and perhaps scare you into the bargain. We have got a little off the track, but it is well to know the facts about these things. Now we will return to the shells. Look at that splendid one shaped like a bowl, but with pink lips rolled back through which can be seen changing tints of pink and white. Here is one that is oblong, lined with rose enamel, but having strange horns pointing out at one side. See that beauty, wide open and shaped like a saucer. Dear me, hold it a little toward the light, and there gleams every color of the rainbow on the polished surface. Here is another, striped with hair-like lines in red, yellow, blue, and brown. There is a fan, wide open, beautifully polished, it has no handle, but its colouring is in nearly all tints, and changeable in the light. What a lovely thing is this heart-shaped shell, with a line along the centre and beautifully blending colours on either side. There are many of these scattered around. Now, how can I describe these singular yet perfect shapes banked up against the rocks that are completely hidden on the inside of the cave? Over there is a funny, snarly head, with fine shreds of hair laced over a smooth shell. Ah, what gleams of coloured light shoot through the hair! Here is a bird's nest on a bar, lying side of a wide fan, shaped like a palm leaf. In the platings are curled all colours, pink, blue, yellow, and green. This shell is like a foot, with eighteen or twenty toes, smooth, shining, and of flesh-like tints. This is like a bat's wing, with lines and webs finely tinted. Look at that enameled jug with a pipe at the top. Nearby is a perfect leaf on a small branch. Do you see this worm, ringed around with dark purple stripes? Isn't it queer? In that corner is a trumpet, splendidly coloured inside. That shape over there must be a fool's cap, one mass of sheeny tints inside. Here are beautifully rounded little bowls, all scalloped around the top. Ah, see them glisten and change shades as the light strikes them. See the beetle bugs, with horns sticking out in every direction. And if here isn't a perfect shape of a lady's slipper, the lady should wear it inside out, so all could see its exquisite mother-o'-pearl. 
Here are shells exactly like the feathery wing of a bird, and how Birdie would enjoy snuggling his soft head against the exquisite smoothness of these shells. Is that a large carrot split lengthwise? It looks like it, but no carrot split along its length ever brought to light such rainbows as glint along these. Those shells looking so much like rattles would amuse a lot of babies if they could play in the mermaid's cave. They would try to catch the fine colors, and might cry when they changed and changed and then appeared to dance away. Those serpents, some half uncoiled, some out straight, will not bite. Those flashes are not from dangerous eyes, but only are fine shell tints. Here are a lot of squat jars for holding small ornaments. They are ornaments themselves, are they not? And what queer combs with three shining rows of teeth, each tooth a point of color. Really, I might as well stop. There would be no use in trying to describe a third of these shapes, and as to coloring, with all I have said, you can have but a faint idea of the soft, brilliant, ever-changing hues and gleams in the mermaid's cave. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Lord Dolphin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Lord Dolphin by Harriet Anna Cheever. Chapter Five My Gardens. Long as I have talked of shells, I must say a word or two more about shells that are used as stones. When I was on land a little while, I noticed in front of a few houses walks that I knew at a glance were made from clamshells, so I knew that folks must have machines for pounding up shells, such a beautiful clean white walk as they make. Then, before some fine-looking houses, were great conch shells, oblong and twisted in shape, but pink and smooth inside. Many of them were placed around lovely fountains or urns of flowers. But I want to tell of one very beautiful and costly kind of ornament that is made from some conch shells, pronounced conch. Romans and Greeks but especially the Greeks, used to cut cameos from the onk stone, and men skilled in cutting fine stones and jewels have cut more exquisite cameos or faces from the kind of conch shell that has two layers, one dark, the other light. The word cameo is said to mean one stone upon another. The queen conch is a splendid shell with two distinct layers, one white, the other pink. Out of the white layer is carved perhaps the face of a woman, with a crown of flowers on her head, or it may be the head of a knight with a helmet on. But think of the fineness of the tools that must be used, the tiny files and chisels in carving the lovely delicate shells. The shell cameos with the pink lower stone and white upper figure are most expensive of all. Other shells have brown or black lower layers, and these are not as choice. But when you see your grandma or great auntie wearing a lovely old-fashioned breastpin, bound around with gold, and holding a pink stone, shining like crystal with a white carved head or other figure standing out from the lower stone you may know it is a very valuable ornament and was probably made from one of the finest shells found in the sea imitations are made from porcelain but very likely grandmas or great aunties will be the real conch shell Perhaps you did not know that there are fair and beautiful gardens in my watery home. You may have picked up sprays or bunches of seaweed when running along the beach, and some were perhaps quite pretty, while others had turned brown and looked much like leather. 
would you like to come with lord golfin and take a swim through an ocean garden you would doubtless see such a sight as you have never dreamed could be seen down in the blue water all right i'll turn into a fairy godfather clap you on to my back give you the lungs of a mermaid to prevent your choking in the water and then come on or rather i should say come down why why a fairy-like scene indeed you cry now you have not taken on the evil eye in coming to the bottom of the sea but you have taken a fish eye folks usually hate fishy eyes but no matter you couldn't see the first thing down here with your own natural peepers so be thankful that for a time you can see with eyes like mine now this is not a coral grove it is a garden of flowers and when you exclaim again oh but i had no idea of this i should have to reply of course you hadn't no more had i of the strange and beautiful things on the land until i had to live there a little while folks call these flowers such as they have seen of them weeds seaweeds and i suppose they have to come under that name as they are not planted from seeds but are a wild growth ah but some great planter or gardener surely put all these wonderful shapes and splendid tints in the soft earth of a sea garden and it is all so blithe and gay here are nearly all the shapes in bushes and almost trees that you have in your garden or land and as to flowers there are leaves spires cups bells tassels very much such as you see in your garden at home see these beautiful crimson leaves as large as the top of a small table and cut in such fine even scalloped around the edges and here is one with a great pad of yellow right on the crimson my my is it not colored richly here are leaves shooting out like rafts thick like the leaves of a rubber tree but large and of deep red you might take a sail on one of them and here is a bush shooting upright from its muddy bed all covered with pink sprays on which are pink blossoms doesn't it make you think of a syringa bush only these flowers are pink next comes this plant with a large olive green stem covered thickly with branches bearing flowers resembling pink roses were this plant taken to the church come sunday morning and placed on the pulpit stand you may believe that after the service folks would go crowding about the altar eager to find out its name and whence it came what a clucking of surprise there would be when it was told that not from any hothouse whatsoever but from the depths of the ocean came the full lovely sea roses are these sprays of pink coral no they are sea rods and branches if you pinch the thick stems water will ooze out for they are partly hollow like the pond lily stem i do not wonder you look with questioning surprise at the next plant it is like a mass of purple bushes very sweet growth rather hard to describe although the delicate branches are what look like small dark berries seen through a mist of pinkish hairy spires don't start these merry fishes darting through the next clump of bushes have only come to smell of the carnation pinks the bushes bear are they not strangely like your garden carnations see the fishes nip at those singular pink flowers with a thick fringe hanging from the edges it is a shame to spoil them but some fishes always seem to think that graceful fringe droops down on purpose for them to peck at 
now if the baby were only here you could seat him on these broad flat leaves with delicate spires all along the edges and all of so deep a crimson they surely would attract any child what a queer flower like the backbone of a fish with all the little bones at the side standing out stiff and pointed and all in pinks and purples right in the midst of another plot of thick flat leaves rises a mass of pink sea lilies and they are beautiful but do examine the next bed of leaves are they not curious a thick hollow looking stem goes through the middle of them and on one side of the stem they are deep pink on the other side yellow here are flowers shaped like horns and trumpets what a forest of pinks greens and yellows and here are the greens such greens as you have never seen before now suppose you were going to have a party what decorations could you have if only the ocean blooms would keep fresh for you to use there would be masses of fine furs that would be perfectly beautiful to crowd over the pictures silky threads that placed on creeping green plants would look lovely carried along the table yellow flowers in the midst of masses of fine sea mosses and sea ferns would make your little mites wonder where the fresh strange things grew there could be yards and yards of ribbons ribbons yes long long sprays of yellowish green sea ribbon four or five inches wide going down to narrow ones not more than an inch in width perhaps you would like some sea thistles here they are in thick bunches fine and hairy in faint fair shades of green and what can this be that looks so much like a sponge ah it is a tuft of moss with green spires shooting up in the middle take care here are bunches of cactus with prickly leaves look out don't catch your toe in these sea ferns even that sweet green maiden hair fern might pin down your foot so firmly that it would take a fish's sharp tooth to set you free you may ask why are not these beautifully colored and curiously shaped things brought on shore and sold as they might be for much money and why are they not at least put where folks can see learn about them and admire them but wait a moment what would be the effect if one took a bunch of your garden roses pinks or lilies put them under water and kept them there they would very soon be a drooping shapeless mass they are formed for different element and could not nourish under water especially salt water just so ocean flowers and sea tints can only live in their own element which is not air but water and the faces of our water pansies for we have them would soon fade in what to them would be lifeless air just as the garden pansies would lose their bright faces in the salt sea Great quantities of seaweeds float ashore and are often dried and used as fuel, or perhaps put around garden plants to make them grow. But nothing that grows on the land or in the water can exchange places one with the other and keep alive. It is all very curious and more than I can understand. Yet every creature and every plant is fitted with the place it grows in and is natural to it the food the flowers and the land for the use of folks and the food the plants and the water for the use of fishes are just what the nature of each requires what wisdom end of chapter five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter Six of Lord Dolphin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Lord Dolphin by Harriet Anna Cheever. Chapter Six: My Treasure Grounds. Are you tired? No. Well, that's no great wonder. It is ever so much easier to glide through the water on the broad back of a great fish than to ride horseback or in a car. My sails or fins flap quietly to and fro. The water parts readily to make us a path. No rough winds blow away your hat. There is no danger way down here that a boat will bang against us and roll you off into a cavern or a cave. Now I am taking you into deeper water, which still is not very deep, but I want to show you some other strange things in the world I live in. Here we go sailing in and out of rocks, but do not be alarmed, I know them all. Perhaps you wonder what it is that we keep pressing against, something soft and smooth that sends extra sprays of water over us. What can it be? Well, now put on your thinking cap. What does your mother wash the baby with? What does Michael wash the carriage with? And what is that object in the wire holder in the bathtub? Ah, a sponge, you exclaim. Yes, and here is where they grow. What, sponges grow, you ask? Certainly, and just as with the coral, it took folks a long time to find out whether sponges were plants, shrubs, or insects. Now, it is decided that the sponge is an animal growth, and the same as with coral. The tiny creatures that it starts from dies, and out from the skeleton or frame branches the sponge that sometimes grows very large, and sometimes is of a kind that remains small. One may be as big as a mop, others no larger than an egg. Down in the blue Mediterranean Sea are found the best sponges that grow. They are called horny sponges, and grow in great masses, fine yet tough and durable. A sponge from the Mediterranean, called the turkey sponge, will cost three times as much as a coarser, more brittle one from other waters. They are porous, or full of little holes and hollows. We fishes like to bang against the sponges and feel the sudden spray dash over us. Water we have all around and about us, but a shower bath is not as common a thing. When you buy a sponge, it is round, flat, or cone-shaped. Now see what they look like under water. Here is a little tree, you say. Oh, no. It is only a mass of sponges piled together and branching out as they grow. Here are fans, arches, tiny caves, and many different shapes forming a sponge garden. Queer, isn't it? Oh, lots of things are queer until you learn about them. Would you like to see how I wash myself? Don't laugh so loud. You might scare the fishes. I know very well that it seems to you as if I was washing or bathing all the time, but there, some kind of a water bug has plumped right down into my head and left a lot of sticky sand on it that the water does not wash away. Now don't be alarmed. I won't let you be swept from my back. I'm only going to wash my head. See me swim directly under this mass of sponge swaying out from a rock. There will be no bits of sand clinging to me after I have been sponged a few moments. Here is a sponge that looks as if almost as large as your sun when it rises out of the water. But if you squeeze that fellow dry, the sponge, not the sun, it will not begin to be the size it is now. You could press it into a bowl of moderate size when dry but then take it to the pump or the faucet, fill it with water, and my, what a balloon! Sponges were once called worm nests, and were thought to be mere kind of seaweed, 
but looked at under the sea it would be known at once that they were are neither nest nor weed once in a while sponges seemed to spring directly up from the mud without anything to cling to but generally they are fastened to rocks or large stones and spread out and out from them here they look so much like a kind of herb that folks who make a study of things in nature and are called naturalists for a long time took them to be a kind of sea plant and for years it was a puzzle as to just what they were all full of pores or layers of small cells and some are quite pretty from having a fringe about the cells like eyelashes there are others curiously shaped looking like coral sprays and here and there they look like helmets then there is another form that seems to have long fingers running out and is called mermaid's gloves the form called venus flower basket large and basket shaped might answer for a mermaid's work basket and hold her thimble scissors and thread you had better take care a mermaid may be near this very moment and hear you laughing and remember she could spin you around from one end of the sea to another then leave you high and dry on a big rock in the middle of the ocean now on what do sponges feed dear sakes as if they feed on anything yes they do although they branch and bunch out in the forms described yet they do not roam about but only float or swim out as far as they can stretch themselves while firmly fastened to a rock here they take in specks or particles that float through the water they pass through the open pores of the body and answer for food the water constantly passing through them serves to refresh and keep them round and healthy here we come to a perfect thicket of sponges and see the fishes playing tag all around them there that shy little fish like a salt water pickerel nip the tail of that great clumsy porpoise porpoise so hard i heard the big fish grunt the teeth of a pickerel are fearfully long and sharp oh oh what is that most beautiful thing we see shining with a faint sweet glow down at the bottom of the sea it is in plain sight nestled in the heart of a conch shell it is round has a milk like murkiness yet pinky changing lights like tiny stars that glint and gleam as you look upon it now believe me one of the treasures of the sea i have told you of or shown you this is far and away the most precious it is a pearl only once in a great while will so perfect and so valuable a gem be found near my deep water home and although we are not very far east yet it would be called an orient or an eastern pearl perhaps it has floated in a polished pink bed from a far eastern sea I told you a little while ago that I must explain what an oyster had to do with folks that sported too many jewels, and why it might be amused at the sight. Did you know that inside of an oyster shell grew the lovely costly pearls that folks will give a great deal of money for? Why, Queen Victoria of England had a Scotch pearl that cost two hundred dollars queens and princes rich folks jewelers and dealers in precious stones will give great sums of money for necklaces brooches or rings that have in them the precious oriental pearls i had to listen very hard to find out what i did about pearls but i found that they have been known talked of and written about almost ever since the beginning of the world oyster beds are generally much nearer the shore than most kinds of shells it is said to be when an oyster gets restless or uneasy that a strange substance enters the edge of the shell 
and after a time a pearl is formed and while many pearls are found in oyster shells they are often found fastened to the pink bosom of a conch shell there are black pearls of much value but though rare they are never as beautiful as a white or pink one some pink pearls are very lovely and while large sized are also very expensive the pearl we see lying here is a splendid white one and my the money it would bring pick up that shell carry it with you to a jeweler and see the dollars the fair round gem will, will bring your purse you could buy yourself beautiful clothes or a pony or have with it a fine party flowers favors treat and all what don't dare to oh me me what a little coward i can't pick it up very well if i took it in my mouth down my throat it would go if i tried to catch it up with a fin over into the water it would bounce never mind look at its sweetly beautiful conch shell with the splendid gem resting so softly on its pink polished side and let me tell you what i think the opinion of a fish even as a great lordly one may not be worth much but to me that exquisitely lovely stone reposing on that exquisitely lovely shell is a far more beautiful thing to look upon than the jewel ever could be when fitted into the costliest setting of gold now it is just as it was made and i think that whoever formed and set that pearl knew more about real beauty and fitness and what is simple natural and very beautiful than all the folks and jewelers in the world look at that white splendor don't you agree with me end of chapter six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter seven of lord dolphin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Lord Dolphin by Harriet Anna Cheever Chapter 7 What I Saw One Day Now, I do not know how brave an English lord may be, or how much it may take to scare him, but I, Lord Dolphin, inhabitant of the great Mediterranean Sea, was scared nearly out of my wits and skin by the sight i saw one day but there is this to comfort me if i was a coward at the sight there were plenty of other creatures in the sea to keep me company mercy on us such a scuttling and rushing such a whisking and a whacking flying and plunging i for one never saw before there was actually a chorus of flapping fins and thumping tails as we raced for our lives was it a steam engine or a monster boiler that was coming right down from upper regions into our midst or had some new sea monster fallen from the skies to drive us from our hunting and fishing grounds we knew something about sea lions the huge creature that you may have seen at the zoo or in a tank at the park lifting itself like an enormous seahorse and roaring like the animal whose name it bears but a sea lion would not have cut through the water from way above it would have come steering along like a great black vessel puffing and blowing while all the time it would have been a creature of the sea and we should have known it and not have been so terrified or had a whale come bearing down from upper waters as they sometimes do there would have been a disturbance first made by the spouting and slashing that our instinct at once would have told us come from some monster of the deep or again had it been the hulk of a vessel that could not stand some violent storm oh yes 
we should have known what that was too but now off tore the fishes mad with terror big fishes little fishes fat fellows lean fellows pleasant ones and grumblers i laughed yes with all my fright i had to laugh at such a funny sight i was behind what folks call whole schools of fishes only they speak of a school of fish meaning many of one kind but the madcap crowd i looked upon was made up of almost every size and sort i saw a porpoise porpoise my enormous cousin all of fifteen feet long crowd in midst a multitude of swift little swimmers as if he meant to make them help in spinning him through the water faster than he could go by himself then on the back of another dolphin i saw a crowd of little fishes that seemed so stiff with fear they had been knowing enough to cling to the back of the great fish making a boat of him to bear them to a place of safety paddling sideways i caught a glimpse of the flying fish that had been my tormentor all at once i stopped short now they say that some folks are very curious i do not mean that they are odd or amusing to look at but they have curiosity and want to peer and pry into things it is not at all nice to want to find out all about other folks affairs it belongs to a poor mean nature to want to do that but to want to inquire into matters for the sake of getting true knowledge is right and worthy even for a fish and suddenly i had determined to see just what the amazing creature could be if it caught and swallowed me alive it might but it would take a pretty big swallow to make away with lord dolphin i confess to going to work very much like a sneak but it was quite easy seeing all the other fishes had made off and left me a clear field to hide midst a bed of tall sea bushes so very gently back i paddled with motion slow and noiseless to the region where the monster had come down how shall i describe it in the first place i had never seen such a shape before the time when i was borne aloft on high waves and looked into a ship's cabin i saw forms something like unto this one in some respects but dear sakes not with such hideous parts but now to name at once and described afterwards it was a diver the diver belongs to the folks family but bless us his rig imagine if you can a black object with a great bunchy machine of a head and for the rest a mass of fixtures such as would puzzle a far more stupid creature than a dolphin to make out i have seen a diver many times since then and am now able to tell a little about the fantastic looking being of course there is very much more to be known but if you remember what i say it will give you some idea of a diver's outfit that may linger in your mind to be added to as you grow older first then close to his skin are warm woolen garments sometimes two or even three sets of them if the weather is cold he may have on two or three pairs of warm stockings how would you like being bundled up in that way yet that is only the beginning close to his head is a woolen cap coming down over his ears thick shoulder pads keep his outside suit from grazing or hurting and it may be that other pads are about his body he next goes into an outside suit of india rubber covered both inside and outside with a tanned twill which is waterproof and the rubber itself has been treated in a way to make it very hard and lasting there is a double collar about the neck of tough sheet rubber and one is to draw well up about the neck he must have assistance in getting into these rigid clothes 
for it is hard working the arms into the stiff sleeves and forcing the hands through cuffs which are made to expand or let out as they are drawn on then close tight in some odd way with rubber rings and joints at the wrist making the sleeves perfectly air tight great care is taken in dressing the diver everything must fit perfectly every screw must be properly wound in every strap and buckle made fast or the poor diver may be in great danger his breastplate of copper is fastened on with metal clasps or bolts a fixture at his back steadies the weights both back and front weighing forty pounds each these weights it must be are in some way supported by the ropes with which they let him down such boots stout leather with soles of lead securely strapped on and weighing at least twenty pounds each a band fitted about his waist is kept in place by strong braces then his helmet tin copper and full of screws pipes and hooks on the face part were three openings as in a lantern in which were screwed plate glasses or bull's eyes these of course were to see through and stood out like little telescopes or half tumblers with brass frames around them called guards which protect the glass that is thick and strong there were also queer valves or tubes in the helmet for letting out bad air yet so contrived that no water could get in a hook was on either side through which ropes must pass the diver can breathe while under water by means of an air pipe and by pulling on a lifeline can make his wants known to those above when the diver is all ready to descend a man at the pump begins supplying him with air and down he goes first on an iron ladder at the vessel's side then on long ladders of rope with heavy weights at the ends i peeped from midst green weed pads and saw the diver as he reached the bottom of the sea do you wonder i trembled yet was amused at what i saw in his hands this time for i saw him more than once after this was a great hook and a light bag with a wide open mouth and what do you think he had come to get sponges from the blue sea of course not at very great depth he knew his work with the long hook sponge after sponge was torn from its clung to home on the slippery rocks and quickly popped into the bag he always moved backwards if anything stopped him rock wreck or floating weeds he could turn slowly and carefully around and see what it was but should he meet an object suddenly at the fore it might break even his shielded glass then he must immediately give the signal to be raised aloft divers must begin by going down only a little way under the water as it takes great skill and long practice to go safely into deep water a diver has about him a coil of line connected with the ladder which he unwinds as he moves away but by winding it about him again he can find his way back to the ladder if two divers go down at the same time i notice they take great care not to let their air lines or life lines cross each other's and so get entangled it might be a very serious affair to get them mixed i see that divers may go down from either a barge a sailing vessel or a large yacht but there must be a deck that can hold the necessary machines and rigging to help them in their work by casting down heavy pieces of lead the sailor folk can sound or tell the distance to the bottom of the sea the diver's line must always be twice the length of the distance he goes down i did not find this all out at once oh by no means but by not running away i gradually learned a great deal 
and I was so glad I saw the queer performance. The frightened fishes were not quick to come back to their playground, where such a looking object had come swinging down, and when he came again the next day and the next, I had the place to myself and watched while he pretty well cleared that region of its fine, valuable sponges. The next time I saw a diver it was in deeper water. I was sporting to and fro at another time when there was just such a panic among the fishes as I had seen before, and just such a scramble. Down, down came the fearsome-looking object, while I mixed myself in with a mass of sea-flowers, and keeping perfectly still was not noticed. The diver's dress was much the same as the others had been. He went backwards in the same cautious way, but instead of a long-handled hook he carried only a queer bag that was let down to him by ropes. The big bag was deep and had a frame along the top, with a scraper fastened to it. And what do you think again? He began scraping all the conch shells he could see that had what looked like a dab of mud or milky spot on the side. He was after pearls. Divers often fish for pearls midst oyster beds and in more shallow water, but there are nets or dredgers also used for that purpose. But I at once knew that very valuable pearls must often be found in conch shells and deep-sea oyster shells, as the diver scraped in all of both that he could find. Remember? All kinds of shellfish are called mollusca, have white blood and breathe not only in the water but also in the air. And will you believe it? I have found out considerable about the signals that a diver gives to the man at the pump on the deck. If he wants to be pulled up, he gives the lifeline four sharp pulls. If he wants more air, he gives one pull at the air pipe. Two pulls on the lifeline and two pulls on the air pipe, given quickly one after the other, mean that he is in trouble and wants the help of another diver. One pull on the lifeline means all right. There are many other signals I could not find out the meaning of, so can say nothing about. My instincts, as well as what I have noticed, tell me that a diver must be in the best of health, must be rather thin, have excellent eyesight, sound lungs, steady nerves, and a strong heart. The work is not easy. I wonder if work that pays well is often easy. I do not believe it is. There used to be a strange machine in use called the diving bell, a great cast iron cage shaped something like a bell, let down by ropes, and so heavy that its own weight would sink it. Divers could sit inside, and fresh air was supplied by a force pump. Bull's eyes of heavy glass let in the light. This must have frightened the fishes quite as much as did the diver, although it was not as frightful in appearance. After a time, when the diver came down, some of my mates, seeing I was not a bit afraid, if only hidden from sight myself, stayed near me under the broad seaweeds, but most of them fled far and wide at his approach. The divers themselves are not free from danger. Great sea serpents or sharks sometimes make it hot for them, but they are watchful, spry, and being folks with power to think and plan, can generally look out for themselves and their safety. End of chapter 7 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 8 of Lord Dolphin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Lord Dolphin by Harriet Anna Cheever. Chapter Eight: My Strange Adventure. Now come the most exciting and in some respects the hardest events of my life thus far. I have told of my great love of music, and have also said that the Dolphin family is a very sociable one. Yes, and I could grow fond of folks, I know, if only they could live in the sea, or I could live on the land. But as neither of these things can be, I must be content with liking them at a distance. One afternoon I was full of sport, and felt lively as a cricket. Oh, yes, I know the small, frisky fellow you call a cricket, with his little old black legs, and have heard him sing. So on this calm and lovely afternoon I began leaping upward instead of forward, and all at once I heard sounds of music floating across the upper sea. You can believe I floundered alongside, and oh, such sweetness as trilled out into the clean air. The truth was, a great steamer was crossing the Mediterranean with a pleasure party on board. What I heard was the music of a brass band. My, my, isn't it enough to delight the heart of any creature that has ears to hear? It actually would make a fish dance. Now, I didn't know it, but I made such plunges upward that my great dark body could be seen in the clear water, and some sailors began laying for me, half suspecting what might happen. Well, a uh, well, I got so full of music, joy, and friskiness that all at once I gave a tremendous jump and flounced right on to the deck of the fine steamer. Had I not been so utterly surprised, I should immediately have flounced back again to my ocean bed, quick shot, as I afterward heard a sailor say. But dear, dearie me, I hesitated just a moment too long, and when I made a flop intending to bounce away, lo, a stout rope was about my body, and another about my tail, and I was a prisoner. Then the folks all gathered about me and the sailors went laughing off, saying something about making the fellow's bed. Oh, it was all very strange and unnatural, and in a few moments I began panting for breath, just as you would gasp if by accident you popped over from a boat into the water. Only you would gasp for want of air, and I was gasping from too much of it. But it was not long before I was taken to a side of the vessel, and after straining and tugging with my great weight, I was indeed bounced into water. But when I tried to swim, oh misery, what kind of a place was I in? Only a tank, some twenty feet long by fifteen feet wide, filled with sea water. Truth was, there was a man folk on board who had caught and wanted to carry to a great park in some far distant land a crocodile. Boo! A great sea reptile that I wonder anyone should want to have around, even as a curiosity. It had been taken from the river Nile in Egypt, much farther up the Mediterranean borders than I had ever been. The crocodile did not live, so I was put into its tank and that was the bed the sailors had made, by filling it with salt water. Shade of my royal grandfathers, how long I could live in such pinching quarters was a question. I was given plenty of herring, so called, and other kinds of fish to eat, and folks visited me about every hour of the day. There were children on the steamer, 
pretty little dears that never tired of talking to me and between them all passengers sailors and their children i learned how folks talked and a great many other things besides one fine manly little fellow visited me constantly he was voyaging for his health and took much pleasure in sitting beside the tank book in hand yet watching my movements and once he said something that made me wish i could talk in the language of folks yet before i tell what it was i want to say that there was one thing i did not like at all but was not able to let the folks know it the sailors called me dolly a great name to give a lord of the sea a fellow bearing the title i owned the next morning after my capture a really fine jack sailors are all jack you know came rolling toward my tank and sang out in a sea breezy fashion hello dolly my dear how do you find yourself to-day i liked his hearty manner and cheery voice but dear me i was dolly to every man jack on board after that and to all the others as well so this dear little man once said to me oh dolly how i wish you could tell me about things under the sea i know if you could only talk my way you could tell stories by the hour and what pleasure it would be to listen stories indeed my pretty i thought and i did wish i could open my wide mouth and entertain the little fellow with a few sea yarns and now that in some way i can make folks understand me i only hope that my young steamer friend among others will see and enjoy lord dolphin's story then the lady folks were fine with their pretty dresses nice manners and soft voices but i did so like the children one cute little nymph of a girl was crazy to get near me yet nearly scared to pieces if i so much as looked at her oh she was so fair to see with her golden hair flying back in the breeze eyes blue as a sea and her sweet dimpled face full of smiles she would come running up to the tank with a great show of courage crying bravely hi old mr dolly i see going a put your gray eye out but when the eye half looked at her off she would scud and all i could see was a mass of flying yellow hair a whisking of snowy skirts and my little nymph was gone a dozen times a day she would appear and as long as i remained under water she would hover near there was a railing around the tank which was sunk in lower than the deck so she could not fall in nor could i possibly get out but as soon as my head began rearing above the water scoot little amy was missing we had no hard storm while steaming over the bright mediterranean but one day the little man whose name was roland said to wee amy clear day isn't it and amy replied woman fashion yes booful day but what sod you do if there comed a big storm and we all went rickety rockety and couldn't stand up a single minute wouldn't you be fraid no said roland speaking slowly and thoughtfully i don't think i should be much fraid but i should want to keep quiet and think what should you do and he smiled oh me would say my prayers and keep a saying them said the child soberly then she added and up would go my prayers into the sky and so i needn't be frightened a bit now i don't know in the least what prayers mean but i remembered at once what the other child had done in the storm and it made me think that the friend the other girl trusted lives up in the sky and can hear when folks tell that they need help how lovely really 
folks ought to be very thankful for all they know. End of chapter 8 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 9 of Lord Dolphin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Lord Dolphin by Harriet Anna Cheever. Chapter 9 Lord Dolphin on Land well we sailed and we sailed but it was poor sailing for me and every hour i longed to make a monster jump clear the railing and splash into the splendid bed beneath the cooped up tank but folks know how to make things strong and secure and once or twice when i tried leaping it was only to bang my sides against the edges of the tank and spatter the deck far and wide, making extra work for the sailors. After a time we ran through what Jack called the Strait of Gibraltar, and were in the great Atlantic Ocean, and one day Jack said to me, Now then, my hearty, we're making a beeline for New York City, and it's a big tub they'll be giving you at the fine park, I'm thinking so i knew i was to take the place of the crocodile and be made a show of i tried to make the best of things folks amused me by standing near the tank and talking about affairs the band played delightfully salt water was freshly supplied me every day or two i learned that my fare was much greater than any other voyagers on board that is it cost more to carry me but think of a passenger that would have been perfectly thankful to have been thrown overboard. I was that same fellow. After about ten days, which seemed like a year to me, there was great excitement all around, such a running and tramping, such a waving of hats and handkerchiefs. Ah, we were landing. Roland came to my side and exclaimed, Goodbye, Dolly, old boy. I may see you some time in your new quarters. Little Amy lisped a hurried, Bye-bye, Dolly, good fishy. And after an hour or two, all the passengers had left the boat except the man who owned me and myself. Nor was I moved until the next day. Then I was made to swim into a smaller tank, not much longer than I am in which I could not have lived, it seems to me, a single day. But I was next boosted, tank and all, onto a great dray, drawn by creatures called horses. Sailors joked, drivers laughed, a crowd peered at me with eyes full of wonder, and I was given my first ride on land, yet in what to me was a mere puddle of water. Ah! how new and strange the jolting and the bouncing the noise the whistles the voices rattling of heavy wagons booming of cars overhead and along the ground strange calls and ringing of bells the whole mixed racket nearly stunning me for my hearing is very acute and sharp i cannot tell you how distracting it all was to a poor pent-up fish I felt like anything but a lord then. And what was this unknown matter floating into my squeezed-up basin? Dust! Something I had never seen before, and I didn't like it. The sea for me, first, last, and forever. At the park I must say things were fine, and could they only have been more natural? I should have had considerable fun. I found that a dolphin on land, although kept in a small square pond, was indeed quite a curiosity, both to young folks and older ones. I imagined that a quantity of coarse salt was thrown 
every little while into the larger space now given me else i could scarcely have lived but my keepers were attentive and kind the young folks threw me many kinds of strange food and bless my lights as jack would say what kind of things do folks live on great quantities of little oblong balls snapped out of a shell different from any kind of shell i have ever seen before were thrown me nearly every hour of the day oh yes they were called peanuts really i liked them only it took about a hundred to get enough to chew on then there were white things making me think of some small shells as there were peeps of yellow inside ah i remember again they were named popcorn i preferred the peanuts i didn't know what to think of taffy jinx how it stuck to a fellow's jaws bah the whole lot of stuff called candy was too sweet and sticky some jolly-looking people that came to the park for what they call a picnic tossed me queer food named doughnuts and ginger snaps yes i liked them too particularly the snaps then there was an everlasting fruit named banana that i liked at first it was so soft and slipped down so easily but i had too much of it and grew tired of it i grew tame would raise my great head close to the strong wire netting and over would come all kinds of what folks call treats once however a man folk threw me part of a small round dark roll or stick such as men folk put in their mouths at one end and sent out a smoke from the other end boo bumaloo what stuff bitter and horrid men folks must have a queer taste to enjoy tasting and smoking such black weedy things one taste of a cigar was enough for me i was sorry not to see the boy roland or the little girl amy again but i think they may have gone to some other land place and so could not come to the park but although i saw so many other pleasant young folks i did not forget them then to my sorrow just as i was getting used to things although always in a homesick way i heard the keepers talking and learned that i was to be moved to another great city where there was to be an exposition or showing of strange and useful things from many different lands and seas really an exhibition i began growing flabby and thin my spirits were at ebb tide very low i felt as if pining to death ah me i would have given all the pearls of the ocean and sea could i have got a hold of them to be back in my own dear mediterranean groves end of chapter nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c